Hi, welcome to Don't Deny the Power TV. I'm here with my great friend, Cedric. We've been friends for a while now, and he's a good friend, but he also runs a ministry called Unite. So I just want to hear a bit about him first, and then some stuff about Unite. So, Cedric, just introduce yourself to the people. Okay, hello people. Um, my name's Cedric, as Terry's just told you, Cedric Barber, and we live in Stoke-on-Trent. And for about five and a half years now, we've been running a ministry called Unite, but I have to talk about me, not about Unite. Um, I'm married to Jean, and we live here in this house, in this particular studio that's being recorded at the moment. And uh, we are in Stoke-on-Trent, we're near to Biddulph, which is where our church is, we're near to Maucop, where the primitive Methodist Christian revival took place 200 years ago, and we are privileged to be here because we think it's going to happen again. We see it happening again, and uh, we, we're just very privileged to be in this generation uh, and have friends like Terry um, and various other prophetic people, Terry, who um, you know the times, and uh, we do know that God is moving and doing amazing things. So uh, that's where we are. Great. Let me let me ask a few questions then. So tell us a bit about your life. Well, I, I was born quite a long time ago. Uh, we, we're coming up to uh, 70 Unite meetings tomorrow. And next year, we'll be, each of us will be 70. So we've been around for a little while. Uh, both of us born in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, I grew up partly here, partly in Yorkshire. Uh, so I'm a, a bit of a Yorkshire lad. I can relate to Terry and Terry and Jill, uh, coming from Yorkshire, North Yorkshire. Um, so it's a long time ago. We we had a Christian upbringing, Sunday school, etc. Lots of, of different things must have happened to Jean and happened to me along the way. Some good things, some bad things. Let me uh, stop you. Go on. Tell me a little bit about your police career. That's oh. interesting. Okay. Well, I joined the police when I was 24. 25 and um, I was in the police for 16 years I joined in Worcestershire and it wasn't really what I wanted to do I lied about my height to get in for one thing but I was very clever I got A-levels and things like that so yeah, they, they let me go in and um, it was an interesting time saw all sorts of stuff I saw murders, murderers, arrested them, interviewed them rapists and all that sort of stuff just par for the course really. and what rank did you rise to? Well, I was a sergeant. Uh, I did some acting inspector. I was qualified to inspector. Um, but I ended up being a sergeant in a little town in Shropshire called Market Drayton. Uh, quite old-fashioned town. And, um, you know, where the shopkeepers would invite you in and you needed some sausages, they'd give you some sausages. Or, or it was the baker's shop, they'd give you some bread. It was very user-friendly for policemen, very old-fashioned. Mm. I think it's changed quite mm. a lot. Because I left, I left there in 1989. Wonderful. Let me just ask you a little bit about that now. So just talk a little bit about your Christian conversion <coughs> and how that <coughs> happened and what it means to you. Mm. Okay, well it was while I was in the police force. Um, this was in, in Worcestershire. Sorry. It, I was in the police force in Worcestershire most of the time moving up to Shropshire towards um, the end of my father's life to get nearer to him as he was in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, but he actually died before the family had got moved to um, to Shropshire, and uh, whew, a couple of round about that time, I would say, um, I um, well, it was at the funeral of my dad. I I travelled up here to uh, Stoke on Trent, and uh, yeah, there'd, there'd been the funeral. Lots of people in my mum's home. Mum's not a very good entertainer, so I had to help her with everything. But I had to just get out in my car, just go somewhere. I just had to drive anywhere. So I drove down the road and I, I ended up, strangely, at my old Sunday school teacher's house, which was just a couple of miles away from where we live now. I ended up there and I said um, to this lady, whose name was Mrs Good, she and her husband used to teach in Sunday school. They had no children of their own. Um, but they had lots and lots, hundreds of children through the Sunday school. And she made a cup of tea for me. And I said, where's Mr. Good? And she just broke down in tears. He died uh, some months before. 
and I didn't know. And it was the day of my dad. So we both cried together. We just both cried so much. But what had happened was about two years before that, I, I went on an off chance visit to their house. First time I'd seen them since I was a boy. And living so far away, I thought, well, I must go and speak to them. And I went and spoke. And we talked about this and that. And people who had gone to prison, the other one had been very successful. And I said, well, what is it, Mr. Good, that you know, you've got to do to keep on the right track? And this was very, very worldly conversation about people, places, and the time that we lived in. But his answer to me was, well, I always say, believe on the Lord thy God, Jesus Christ, Cedric, and thou shalt be saved. He said it in very old-fashioned language, and it really didn't mean anything to me. I, in fact, I felt a little bit... I wasn't offended. I, people don't offend me when they say things like that. But I just felt it just wasn't for me. You know? And it went completely out of my head. I've sort of jumped back in time there. It doesn't, not telling it too well. But going forward in time, another couple of years, to 1987, <clears throat> I was sitting on my own in my house. It'd been on nights. There was nobody else there. It was September and the sun was shining low through the window. It seemed as though the room was flooded with light. I'd been reading a biography of David Livingstone. I used to like to read biographies of famous people, yeah. Margaret Thatcher, and anybody really who'd, who'd made it. Oh, it's a strong people. And this was David Livingstone with a reputation. But every time he got ill, got cholera or broke his leg, he gave thanks to God. And I couldn't understand, I couldn't work it out. I was reading this autobiography. I was listening to some secular songs on the... It was on a record player, actually, I think. And I liked them. I used to sing them in a choir when I was young. Mm -hmm. Secular songs. Until one came on where the last verse was, Were the whole realm of nature mine, That were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, Demands my life, my, my soul, my life, my all. I, and then words came to me. And the words were, Believe on the Lord thy God, Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I'd never, ever had a spiritual experience before. I'd never had anything like from outside of me. Mm. That, and there was definite, I wasn't remembered, because I'd never remembered those words at all. Mm. The thou's and the these and stuff yeah. like that. But it came to me then, and I knew that I had to respond to it. And so I did. I said, yes, I will. Mm. Yes, I will. I will believe. And I will receive from it. You know. And it was an amazing time. Mm. And it, I think it was the 27th of September, 1987. Mm. And uh, it totally transformed my life. People say these things, mm. but it changed me. Life was so different. As a policeman, I could walk to a fight mm. between a group of men and say, stop. And they stop. I didn't have to shout, call for reinforcement. I could see prisoners in the street. And I say to them, do you, like people I'd have in the cells, yes. do you believe in God? And they said, well, I don't believe in anything I can't see. Mm. And then he said, well, oh, I can't see the wind, but that's that. I said, that's just what Jesus said. Yes. You know? And then there was a time in the police station, during this first few months of my conversion, mm. they had a man who used to sell fine china but it was all it was all old ropey old pottery but the one that he showed everybody was fine china and he got everybody in the ho he rent rented a room in a hotel and he sold 50 or so of these pieces of china but they were all old rubbish not the one that he'd got in the box he'd go without paying his bill he'd done it all over the country there was police for we and we arrested him in market drayton and there were police forces from all over the country come to interview him customs and excise police sergeants D DS's, DI's and things from all over the place. The charge room was full and I was the custody sergeant. And there was certain, you know, when we were going to take questions. And I said, one of them said, well, isn't it time you, you gave this up now? It's too late for me, he said. It's too late for me to give up the crime now. Mm. And so in, all, in front of all these people, probably about 50 senior policemen and customs and excise officials, I said, there was a thief hanging on a cross next to Jesus. And he turned to Jesus and he repented. And Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. 
it wasn't too late for him and it's not too late for you. That's wonderful. It went down like a lead balloon. Yeah, but it's wonderful. <laughs> let me just let me just finish here now because we're coming up to the end of part one of Don't Deny the Power with Cedric Barber. And it is a Don't Deny the Power story. You've heard it here. And I just want to say to you, we want to say, Cedric and I, just like that thief on the cross, there was two on the cross with Jesus, there was three. Mm -hmm. And one of them called on his name, and that day would be with him in paradise. Mm -hmm. It's pretty phenomenal. So today, wherever you are, you can call on the name of the Lord thy God, yeah. like Cedric Barber did. And you're going to hear in part two even more of an amazing story. So stay blessed from Cedric Barber and Terry Eckersley. And don't deny the power. Ciao for now. We love you. Bye-bye.